The video you are about to watch is from an old woodworking magazine that I published during the years of 2003 to approximately 2006. This was a very unique magazine. It was purely video content and it was distributed on DVDs. The magazine ran for approximately three and a half years and then uh, due to financial concerns we simply had to terminate the magazine. We moved on to other things over the last roughly 15 years. However, there has been a request to resurrect this content, so I've gone through the trouble to get the equipment, the products, everything I needed in order to bring this content back to life to share with everyone. Here on this YouTube channel, we'll be putting up approximately 100 to 120 of the original stories that appeared in that magazine. The magazine was called Woodworking at Home Magazine, and it was truly one of a kind in the world. I really hope you enjoy these videos, and please tell your friends about them. This is the completed curio shelf, and of course we'll be showing you each and every step on how to construct it. There's just a couple things I'd like to point out real quickly. Of course you can see that we've chosen maple and paduke as our primary woods for this. You can, of course, use uh, walnut or even cherry for the darker wood on the outer edges. Notice, too, that the grain is continuous all the way down across the top of our base as well as down on the front in the toe kick. So make sure that you lay out your boards accordingly so you get a nice flowing grain pattern there. Now the first thing that we're going to construct will be the back panel. And that's really the foundation of where we need to build everything off of and we have to focus a lot of attention on joining together the Paducah and Maple pieces. It's all straight down in this area all the way down, but up here it flares out with this beautiful graceful curve. And that's going to be a little bit of a challenge, but we'll show you how to do it. I got started on our back panel by first ripping my two side panels to about nine and a half inches wide. I then took a piece of maple that was about 13 inches wide and I re-ripped that so that it's about 12 and a half inches wide. And that gives me a little bit of trimming room once we start fitting these two pieces together. Now on the upper portion of the maple center piece I needed to add on a couple of strips so I just glued those on and that gives me an overall width of 18 inches. And that'll come down about 26 inches from the top edge. And this is where the curved area is going to be machined. So we'll have to actually machine that curve on the two side pieces on, and on each side of the maple piece. Now to do that we're going to be using a router with a template. And I've already started working on the template and I'll show you that layout now. For my template I'm using quarter inch thick birch plywood and I've carefully laid out some locations on it. This line up here represents the top edge of the center maple piece. This line represents the top edge of the two side Paduk pieces. Further down, exactly 23 inches from the line that represents the top of the maple, I've drawn a line representing where our curve will start to blend in. So we want our curve to be nice and tangent or blending nicely right at this point. Now we need that curve to come over two and a half inches from the outside edge of our template and that two and a half inches is measured at the line where our, that represents the top of our maple piece. So now what I'm going to do, I had to use a larger bow than my normal one that I use with a string, and this one's just the same principle. It's a, a thin strip of wood, and I've got it between a bar clamp, and I can draw tension or compress that bar clamp, and that'll increase or decrease this curve. So what I want that curve to do is line up with this point, up here, two and a half inches in from the edge, and it'd be a nice smooth blend back here, which is 23 inches down. So I'll just adjust the tension, and I'm opening the clamp right now, and notice the curve is getting less. I'll tighten up the clamp, and that curve will come out. And I want that, that point and this point to be perfectly matched up. Now this point on the bow is about the midpoint of its length. And that'll give us that nice tangent blend. So I've got it just about right. Just a little bit of adjustment. And then we can go ahead and draw on our line. 
And I'll continue that line all the way up off the top edge of our template. Now over here at the bandsaw, I'll go ahead and cut away the waste material, but I'll be sure to leave the line on our template. We'll trim that up later with a sander. One of the accessories I have for my table saw is an abrasive sanding disc. And you mount it on your table saw like you would a saw blade. And this allows me to have a sanding disc with a very, very large flat work area to help support larger pieces. Now we'll start with our basic layout for that curved blend between our Paduk side pieces and the center maple piece. And of course, I still have my template and I've taken and drawn on my center maple piece, as well as the Paduk pieces, the starting point of the curve, and then the top edge of the two pieces. Now what I want to do is take my template, and I'll lay it on top of my Paduk piece first, and I want to line up this edge, that's the straight edge, so that it's nice and flush with the template. And of course, I'll line up my two marks. This one's showing the start of the curve on the template, and I've got the same mark on the Paduk. So we'll line that up carefully, make sure that my other edge is perfectly flat and flush along the straight edge, and then we'll draw in the line on the paduke. Now this line is only going to serve the function of allowing me to bandsaw away most of the waste material. Now I'll do the same thing over here on the maple piece, being careful to line up my straight edge along the straight edge of the maple piece, line up my layout marks for the start point of that curve. Now I can go ahead and bandsaw away most of the waste, but I do want to leave the line because we've got some more work to do on that piece. I'm getting ready now to machine that edge between the maple center panel and the Paduk outer panel. I've placed some scrap material on top of my workbench so that when I'm using my router I can cut through the material and not harm my workbench. Now I'll bring the Paduk piece into position and this layout line right here represents the start of where this curve blends out. I want those two to line up perfectly this way. Next I bring in my template. And again, here's that same layout mark representing the start of that curve, and I want that to line up perfectly with the other two pieces. And I'll just kind of bring this in roughly in alignment with the edge of the Paduk piece. Next, I want to make sure that that gap between the Paduk piece and the maple piece is equal along this straight area. So I'm going to use two quarter inch drill bits as spacers. The guide bushing that I'm going to be using is a half inch diameter and it's got a hole large enough to accept a 3 8 inch router bit. Now what I want to do is very carefully bring my template in so that I'm taking an equal amount of material off of both the maple piece and the paduke piece. And I can do that by holding the, temp the guide bushing up against the template and then shifting the two back and forth until I've got the cut balanced out nicely. After I got the spacing and the offset just right for our template, I clamped the template and the Paduk board down to the workbench. I want to make sure that everything is clamped down securely because I don't want anything to shift once we start making these cuts. And I want to emphasize the importance of keeping the gap between the maple and the Paduk even along this area, as well as the gap between the edge of the template and the edge of the Paduk even or parallel all along this area. To machine this joint, I'm going to use a 3 8 inch solid carbide upcut spiral router bit, and that should give me a real nice finish. Here you can see I've added another strip of quarter inch plywood, and that will help balance the router as we're taking these cuts. To make this routing operation as safe as possible, I'm going to be taking a number of 1 16th inch deep passes until I cut all the way through. 
Taking it in small, shallow depths of cut like this will greatly minimize the potential for the bit to grab and for the router to self-feed. Now with all the machining done, we can slide the board in place and notice that you've got a nice tight joint all along that seam. And of course I'll do the same on the other side. Now we need to machine these curves as well as round over the top edges of our back panel and cut it off to length. I'm getting ready now to put the radius on the top edge of our maple centerpiece. Now this line right here represents where I want the top edge of this board to be. These two marks here and here are 1 and 9 sixteenths of an inch down from that point. I've also got another mark at the center line. Again using a bow, I've drawn tension on it until I've gotten the radius to blend correctly between these three points. Now all I need to do, pencil it in and cut it with the jigsaw. Now to clean up that rough sawn edge, I'll just take my belt sander and work around. With a half inch radius roundover bit in my handheld router, I can now round over the top edge of our back panel pieces. When rounding over this edge, there's a good tendency for the maple to split out on this outfeed edge because we'll be cutting towards this direction. So I've clamped a backer block up against the side of my maple piece so that I don't get any tear out there. Now we want to cut the curve on our two Paduk side pieces. Now what I'm going to do is just lay out one, cut it, and then I'll use the one for a template to make the other side. Now I've drawn a line right here that represents the very top edge of the Paduk piece. From that point coming down I've drawn another line, or actually marked it with a piece of masking tape, four and a quarter inches down. Then using the bow I drew a little bit more tension on it because I do want this radius to be slightly smaller than the radius we put at the top of our maple piece. So I just drew a little bit more tension on it and now what I want to do is draw a line from this point over to this point. Then what I can do is I'll saw it and round it over the same way I did with the top of the maple piece. The next step is to glue up the three boards that make up the back panel. And because this is a very important structural element, we do want this glue up to be a very strong glue up. So to reinforce the joint, I'm going to be using biscuits. Now the biscuits that I'm using are number 20 biscuits, and I want them spaced about six to eight inches apart along each joint. Oh, and that fits up beautiful. We're set on this side. I'll repeat the same on the other side, then we're ready for some glue. I'm getting ready now to glue up my three boards that make up the back panel, and I'm using polyurethane glue. And that explains the rubber gloves, because this stuff, once it gets on something, it tends to stay around. And we'll apply enough clamp pressure to draw these joints together good and tight. And don't be afraid to tap either of the two Baduk panels up or down so that you get your nice tight joint along that curved area. a couple of quick passes through on the wide drum sander. I got the back panel pretty well flattened out and smoothed out. Then it's just some passes over it with some 
uh, 120 and 150 grit sandpaper on the random orbit sander and now I've got it all ready and finished sanded. Measuring from the top down, I've drawn a line or a mark at 69 and 13 sixteenths of an inch and now I'll make another mark four inches up and that is the amount of offset for my trim saw. Now what I'll do is I'll use a framing square and make sure I've got a nice square mark along this bottom edge. The next thing we need to do is rip our back panel to its proper width of 30 inches. But we do want to take and balance out the cut so that we have two equal width padauk pieces. So we'll have to take a little off at each side and make adjustments accordingly so that we end up with a 30 inch width and two padauk pieces of equal width. Now we can go ahead and start constructing the two front legs as well as the two shelf supports along the back. And we will, of course, have to drill the holes for the shelf pins. The two front legs are an inch and a half thick by an inch and a half wide. I couldn't pick up inch and a half thick paduk, so I had to laminate two boards together. Now what I need to do is joint one edge, and then I can rip them off to their proper width over at the table saw. The two shelf supports that go along the back panel I've already ripped to an inch and a half wide. Our next step, cut them off to length and then we can go ahead and round over that top edge so it's got that nice curve on it. And just as we've done before, I've used a bow to lay out a radius at the top of our shelf standards that go along the back panel and our two front legs. Now the, the points, I've assumed that this top edge is the top of my leg or shelf support and then I've come down one and three sixteenths of an inch to give me my two control points and then on the bow I've just drawn it up good and tight so that when I draw that line on there it looks more like a curve rather than just a straight line. Now I'll head over to the bandsaw, cut these out and sand them up flush. I've carefully taken the two front legs and the two shelf standards, lined them up so that they're square at the bottom edge, and clamped them together. Then, using a square and a tape measure, I came up 14 inches from the bottom and drew a line across all four boards. I drew another line up near the top edge across all four boards and that is 54 inches up from the bottom and that will show us where the uppermost or the topmost shelf hole will be. Well that's actually the most important step of this indexing jig and this indexing jig is what's going to help us to drill the holes for our shelf pins. Now the only thing I really needed to do there was make sure that this edge was at a right angle to this edge. And I can show you more about that over here at the drill press. Now that you've had a chance to see the jig in action, let me show you a little bit about how it's made. Back here is a fence that's constructed out of a couple of pieces of MDF that have been glued together and ripped to a width of about oh an inch and nine sixteenths, just something a little bit wider than our board is. 
Then I've got another piece of MDF here that's three-eighths of an inch thick, and that'll serve as a shim, and I'll show you a little bit more about that in a moment. The critical component is our stop. That must be at a right angle to the fence, and that's why I use my miter gauge over at the table saw to take a nice smooth cut along there to ensure that that's at a right angle. Now setting up the jig is pretty easy. I'm starting out with drilling my holes in the three-quarter inch thick shelf supports. Now I want my hole to be in the center of this board. So using that 3 8 inch shim back here, I've carefully measured over from that location to the center of my board. So I'm 3 8 of an inch over from the edge. From the point of my drill to my stop, I measured over two inches and clamped the jig down. Now the first hole that we have to drill we have to very accurately and very carefully drill that based on our layout dimension. Once that first hole's drilled, I can drop my pin in there, and in my case, I'm just using a quarter inch diameter clevis pin. I drop that in, bump it up against the stop, and drill my next hole. And then I just keep repeating that all the way through. For the front legs, we don't want the holes to be drilled three eighths of an inch over from the edge, but rather at the center of it. So we don't need this three eighths inch thick shim. Now, here again is our layout mark. I would very carefully line that up with the point on my drill bit. I'm using a brad point bit to help with that. I would drill my first hole, index the part down, and continue all the way along the length of the board. Now we can go ahead and start milling up the shelves as well as the top for our base. All of these components get machined in basically the same processes. There are some variations in dimensions, so pay close attention. We'll also be showing you how to make this interesting and very decorative detail on the front of the shelves. The top of the base requires about the same machining processes as the shelves, so we'll process this board along with our shelves. Now these boards are a glue up from the same boards that I used to make up the back panel. After the back panel was all glued up and trimmed to size, I then knew how wide my maple pieces would be, so then I took my cutoff pieces, these here, trimmed up the pieces to their proper width, glued everything together. Now I did use biscuits and I was very careful as to where I positioned them so that they wouldn't show on the end grain. Now this is going to be the front edge of the platform top, so this will be visible, so you don't want to see a biscuit sticking out in these areas. Now this next piece, which is four inches wide this way, will serve as the toe kick of the curio shelf. Again, I was careful to make sure that the biscuits are concealed, but once the glue up was all done, I sanded the panel flat, and then using a straight edge and a circular saw, I trimmed the pieces up to their proper shape. We'll be needing a total of five shelves that are made out of maple. I'll begin by ripping them to 12 inches wide. my shop made panel cutting jig, I can cross cut them to their correct length. <laughs> to round over the front edge of the shelves, I'm going to be using a three quarter inch radius round over bit. And I'll have to use that in my router table because we want to use or round over nearly the entire front edge of that shelf. As you can see, with the router bit fully up, so that we take a full cut across the front of our three-quarter inch thick shelf, the edge of the board would be underneath the guide bearing. That's why we have to use the fence. Now, because we are removing so much material, and this is a hard maple, you may want to take this in several passes. You can either adjust your fence in each time, taking a little bit more with each cut, or raise your router bit up but I would recommend taking it in a couple of passes. In 
now to notch out the corners to fit around our shelf standard and front legs, I've clamped all five of my shelves together and checked them to make sure everything's lined up good and square as one complete assembly. Now what I'll do is I'll raise up the saw blade to the appropriate height and take my first cut. Then I'll tip the whole assembly over and take the second cut to cut away the corners. While the process is the same, the dimensions are a little different. Be sure to make your adjustments for the top panel for your base. I'm getting ready now to cut the curve on the front edge of the shelf. To do the layout, I simply made a mark at the center point this way, and then I came down 9 sixteenths of an inch from the front edge coming back to show me the starting and ending point of this curve or radius. Then using a simple bow, I've drawn tension on the string until I got the curvature just right to meet up with these three points. Drew the line in, and now I'll use my jigsaw to cut out that line. I don't want to cut this on the bandsaw because the bandsaw is going to be cutting in a downward motion and it may cause chip out or tear out on our top edge. And now I've gone through and sanded up the cut marks to make them nice and smooth along the front. The shelves are now done and I'm just ready for final sanding. The toe kick rests inside of a dado on the bottom surface of our platform top. The platform top also goes into a dado that's a stop dado and that's in the back panel. We'll show you how to machine those now. This is the location where we need to machine that dado. Now I've placed tape at both the start and end points of where we want that stop dado to be located. So I'll plunge the router in at this point, feed over to this location, and then retract the router out. There. Nice snug fit on that dado and that's what we want. Now we can go ahead and machine the dado that will accept the toe kick along the front edge of our platform top. So after carefully laying that out, getting that so I've got it just perfect at a quarter inch setback, I've set my straight edge using the same router setup as before, I can go ahead and route that dado. And on this case I can route all the way through. The shelf standards get fastened against the back panel using biscuits and glue. The primary reason for the biscuits in this application is to help with alignment. Now before gluing anything up, make sure that you finish sand everything because once these are glued in place, it's going to be very difficult to finish sand along this edge. So I've gone through, got that out of the way, and of course we got our biscuit slots cut and I test fit everything to make sure it lines up fine. Now I'll just use regular yellow woodworking glue very sparingly. I really don't want a lot on there and I certainly don't want it squeezing out against this panel. With the bottom end lined up good and flush, I'm going to drive one brad in there and that will help hold it from sliding back and forth this way as we apply clamping pressure. 
After this sits in the clamps for about an hour, I'll repeat the same on the other edge. The side aprons and the front toe kick are held in place at the legs and rear shelf supports using biscuits. Notice also that we've got a quarter inch setback for both the side apron and the front toe kick. Now with that dado machine for our toe kick, we can put the two pieces together, carefully line up the maple and padauk pieces so that we've got a continuous line. Then I can mark the ends and cut off our toe kick to the proper length. We'll also cut off the side apron pieces to their proper overall length too. And I've already gone through and ripped that board to its proper width. I've gone through and dry assembled all of the components in their proper orientation. You'll see up near the top of the curio shelf, I've got one of the shelves just clamped in place and that helps support our front legs. Now I've taken our aprons and our toe kick and the top of our base, got all that in place and in position, and what I need to do next is cut the biscuit slots that will allow us to fasten together the aprons to the rear and front legs as well as the toe kick to the front legs. Now I want a quarter inch setback between the edge of the leg and the face of the apron as well as the toe kick. So we'll have to make an adjustment to the biscuit joiner when we cut those slots. With the fence now adjusted back to 5 eighths of an inch, we can go ahead and machine our offset or our setback for the aprons and toe kick. And that creates a nice reveal. I've already gone through a complete dry assembly, checked everything for square and it's clamping up good. So now I'll go ahead and glue everything together. I'll bring in the platform top, get that in place. Make sure you apply glue along the top edge of our two side aprons. We can get those in place. Next I'll get my biscuits and glue in these areas. And now I'll get the glue and biscuits into the front toe kick. And now we can get our glue in the biscuit slots on the two front legs because we'll be bringing that together with the front apron sliding up into that dado that exists underneath the base top. So slide all these pieces together at once. Kind of a juggling act, but in the dry assembly it went real well. And we'll get some glue along this dado. And we just carefully bring these pieces all together. Now we will have to sneak all of these pieces together because we've got those biscuits and we need to get that front apron up into that dado. The next step, make sure that all of our surfaces are good and flush along the bottom edge. And now we can start clamping everything together. And that should do it. I'll check it for square by laying a framing square inside this area and move it around if needed. Otherwise, we'll let the glue set up and then we can move on. Well, we're nearly complete with the assembly. The last thing we need to do is fix the top shelf. Now, the top shelf is going to stabilize our two front legs and tie the whole unit together. Now, we do have to be mindful of the cross grain situation. On our shelf, the grain is running this way and of course on the back panel the grain is running vertical. So we can't just simply screw it together or glue it together. What we will be doing are using a couple of pocket hole screws about four inches apart right off a of center underneath the shelf at the back and then we'll use a couple of pocket hole screws to hold the front legs up against the shelf. Now we'll head over here by the workbench and I'll show you how we'll do that. For the two back holes, I've already placed two marks on here, two inches off of center. Now I'll be using the Craig pocket hole jig, and I'll use my large jig to drill these two holes. So all I have to do is line up my layout mark with one of the holes on the jig. 
Then we can go ahead and use the drill bit that's provided by Craig to drill the pocket holes. Loosen the clamp, index over to our other hole, and drill that pocket hole. I can't use the larger Craig jig to get in to drill the hole in this area where the front leg is going to be. So they also provide this Craig mini jig. All I need to do is line it up flush with the surface where we want to drill the hole and center it up in the center of where that leg will be and clamp it in place. Then I'm ready to drill that pocket hole. I've already centered up the shelf left to right and got one screw mounted. Now it's a matter of tightening up the other screw. So we'll get the back screwed in place first. When we notched out the shelves for clearance around the legs, we allowed for a 16th inch gap. Now to keep that look consistent across the movable shelves down below, we want to hold our leg flush with the outside edge of the shelf. Now because of the tight area or tight clearance inside here, it's going to be very difficult to use your electric driver. So be prepared to use a hand screwdriver to tighten up your pocket hole screws. With the two different species of wood, finding a good finish that will complement both woods nicely is a bit of a challenge, but I think we've found the right one. Now the challenge comes in, the maple is very tight grained, very smooth textured. The paduke is very open grained, porous, and coarse textured. So the maple would look fine with a nice high gloss finish, but the paduke really wouldn't look well with a high gloss finish unless you went through and filled the grain. So what we've chosen is actually boiled linseed oil. Now in this particular sample here, you can see that we've got it a little bit darker. This one happens to be tongue oil. I'll flip it around, and this is the boiled linseed oil. Now I like the boiled linseed oil, it seemed to bring out a little bit more richness in the paduk. So that's what we chose. Now because we have this paduk right next to the maple, you do want to be careful because the rag may pick up some of the dust from your paduk and you don't want to get this red dust on your maple pieces. So I'll go through and do my maple first and then I'll do my paduk side panels. But just rub it in and then wipe off the excess after it soaks for about five or ten minutes. And now you'll see the richness of this paduk really come alive. Well, that boiled linseed oil really made the paduk and maple come alive. All around, it's a great project and a great addition to any home's decor. Thanks for watching. I sincerely hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you truly enjoyed it, please help us share this information with the rest of the communities. Please hit the subscribe button, give us a big thumbs up, and be sure to tell your friends about this channel. Thanks again for watching.